Okay, right. Let's roll. Okay, so my what I'm going to be talking about is basically how economists have turned what we realise as an existential crisis into what they think uh, is going to be a, um, a you know optimization problem. How do we how do we uh, reduce the damages of climate change without costing ourselves too much? That's the framework that they've got on it. And um, uh, this one, a new book I have, which I make this argument, it's part of the argument there as well as saying there's a different way to do economics. The way that they think you have to do it is not by far not the only way and is actually far better to do it different ways, which I discuss in that book. But uh, if you look at what actually happens when politicians hear from things like the IPCC, most politicians, as we know, don't have any training in the physical sciences. They've done economics or law if we're lucky. Uh, and therefore, they, what they look at is the conventional economic view. They're not critics. They're followers, politicians, as we all, most of us realise. You don't get many charismatic politicians in a lifetime. So they accept what they learned at Economics 101 or PPE as an accurate description of the economy. And they focus on GDP growth. That's the thing. That if you want to get elected, you've got to really talk about how you're going to boost GDP. Okay, That's it. That's the political framing. And then what we're therefore, when they look at what the IPCC forest, as I call it, and if you ever have a look at an IPCC report, you're talking 1,500 pages minimum. Okay, What do they look at? The economics chapter. Well, they send one of their staff to go and look at the economics chapter and summarise it for them. That's what the politicians actually do. And what they see is economists predicting very small economic consequences 80 years from now, which is, you know, forget it. That's somebody else's problem for a, a, post, for a, a, a politician. So, and this is the latest IPCC reports. I'm not talking 2014 now. The draft report 2022 said warming of four degrees Celsius will cause between a 10 and 23% decline in annual global GDP relative to global GDP without warming at all. Okay. So what it's going to saying that the GDP in 2100 will be as much as 23% lower then than it would have been without global warming when they're projecting economic growth to continue going on for the next 80 years. So in effect, in terms of the decline in annual GDP growth, it's less than a 0.1% fall, which economists can't even measure to that accuracy. Today, you see GDP figures are always sort of, you know, 3.1, 3.2. Um, so the, 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 the maximum resolution they can get is a, is a tenth of a percent change in the annual rate, rate of economic growth. This is saying it's worth less than a point, worth less than a tenth of a percent. Well, here gives us stuff, okay? And, and that's that's the framework that politicians have if they take the economists seriously. So it sees the whole thing as being cost-benefit. You have to frame the benefits of attenuating damage against the cost of not doing it. And politicians have the same attitude. They'll do all the sincere speeches. They'll go to COP 21, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, blah, 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 and do the blah, blah, blah. But it's somebody else's problem from their point of view. And they never check our economists got these trivial numbers. Well, I did. And this is just to show that this is not just ancient stuff. We had a paper rejected from the proceedings of the Royal Society by a bunch of neoclassical economists who said, oh, what you're complaining about could never get published these days. Well, bullshit. This is what was published last year. 3.67. Notice two decimal places of accuracy there, which is garbage. It shows here the stuff is made up to begin with from a four degree increase in temperature. 7.22% from another paper over a 4.5% increase. And another paper came out saying that if we lose the West, well, I've got to go through this, we lose the Arctic summer sea ice, Greenland, West Antarctic, the Amazon, um, the AMOC, which we got to call the Gulf Stream, permafrost and ocean methane hydrates, and we scramble the Indian um, uh, um, monsoon, that will reduce GDP by 1.4% compared to a world in which none of those things happen at six degrees above pre-industrial. And this is the framing that economists do. And the Nobel Prize winner Nordhaus in a paper in 2018 in the American Economic Review said a six degree increase in temperature would call a 7.9% fall in GDP. Now that's 7.9% lower than it would be in 2100 in the complete absence of climate change. So again, it's trivial. When you look at scientists are saying, you won't find a scientist talking about more than two degrees because at that point they think it's effectively game over. Uh, Hansen saying back in 2016 that two degrees could be dangerous. 
Stefan and Co in 2018, significant danger of tipping cascades, one, one tipping point causing another to go at two degrees, and the same thing from Lent in 2019. So how do economists and why do they come up with such low estimates of the damages from climate change? And it's really because they're in, they're climate, the global warming deniers, the whole profession, with the exception of heterodox economists and some bit of tiny minority of mainstream people, are really effectively denies, and I've had 50 years experience of seeing this happen. Their attitude basically is that capitalism can cope with anything, so therefore global warming can't be an existential threat. And this is some of the literature that I've been reading through in the last five years. Nordhaus saying in 1991, human societies thrive in a wide range of climatic zones, and for the bulk of economic activity, non-climate variables like labour, skills, access to markets and technology swamp climatic considerations. So what they're saying, if you look around the planet today, and then say, what's the relationship with temperature and GDP today? That's less important than whether you have, you know, highly skilled workforce or uh, you're close to markets or you've got great technology. And that's true, but that's irrelevant to climate change. But this is the framing they've made. Uh, then you have Nordhaus. We did a survey of so-called experts. Of these experts, two, three were climate scientists out of 19. One of them refused to answer the questions. So it was two climate scientists versus 10 economists and five others, and these have been mainly the economists. Uh, impact of a three-degree temperature warming by 2090 would be small potatoes. Okay. And one, and this, I'm sure this is Larry Summers, by the way, because he's one of the so-called experts. It takes a very sharp pencil to see the difference between a world with and without climate change or with and without mitigation. So it's trivia from their point of view. And natural scientists, the, the, the two, two of the three actual climate scientists who answered this uh, questionnaire by Nordhaus gave estimates 20 to 30 times the scale of what the economists were saying. Um, and then 2014, this is the, the previous IPCC, for most economic sectors, the impact of climate change will be small relative to other uh, uh, drivers. Medium evidence, but high agreement. This is the mindset of conventional economists. Now, what they do... They start from believing it's trivial. And then, well, let's, let's assume it's trivial. So what do we need to assume is trivial? Uh, well, let's assume a roof will protect you from climate change. Now, they don't put it quite that bluntly. What they say is um, negligibly affected. 87%, this is Nordhaus in 80, 1981, 87% of the GDP is produced in sectors that will be negligibly affected by climate change. What are those sectors? Manufacturing, mining, utilities, finance. So wholesale and retail trade and government will be unaffected by climate change for the next one, half to three, two, two to three quarters of a century. And the IPC repeats the same thing. Activities such as agriculture, and if I, they've got now mining, they're saying mining actually is affected by the weather, are exposed to the weather and therefore vulnerable to climate change. Other economic activities, such as manufacturing services, largely take place in controlled environments and are not really exposed to climate change. So they're equating climate change to change in the weather. And it's mainly temperature. Now, no other discipline would accept assumptions as crazy as this. And it's accepted in economics because back with the year I was born, 1953, Milton Friedman came up with this piece of bullshit and I'm going to use a lot of technical terms in this presentation, this piece of bullshit, saying that the more significant a theory, the more unrealistic the assumptions. He had a footnote saying that, therefore, this doesn't mean that unrealistic assumptions give you better theory. But nonetheless, that's the way it's been interpreted by economists. So if you've been through an economics degree and you've had perfect competition, perfect information, all this garbage stuff coming being thrown at you, once you accept a crap like that, you can accept crap like this about the empirical world as well, which is what they've done. Now, those, this, this, this methodological logical delusion of Friedman, and I discuss it at length in, in the, my book, The Manifesto, um, it, it was used to evade, not, not to get rid of you know, little details like let's forget about showing where the trees are on the, on the London tube map, which is the way they'll present it, but it's saying let's assume um, that, uh, that wealthy people get paid that much because that's what they're worth. Those sorts of assumptions are what they defend with it. Uh, and, and so they make these assumptions when they defend neoclassical beliefs, and I call it the neoclassical disease and discuss it at a great length in, in my book. So, that, but, but there's an innate belief, once you've, once you've swallowed mainstream economics and you haven't realised all the flaws that are in it, you basically think capitalism can cope with anything because all you've got to do is move your supply and demand curves around on the whiteboard, okay? 
or slightly more complicated stuff if you do a, a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. So they cannot treat this as an existential threat and they reduce it to uh, an optimization problem. Now, how are you going to get this rid of politicians? Well, I think talking just about scientists and and I want Extinction Rebellion's help here, they have to challenge the economists direct, explicitly and directly, and they're starting to do it. So there's a new group called PLAN, which stands for Planetary uh, Limits, um, a Planetary Limits Network, established by Tom Murphy, who's the, econo the, the physicist who wrote the paper or the blog post, Finite Physicist Meets Exponential Economist, or vice versa. Um, so they are starting to fight them. But what, what has stopped scientists doing this is Scientists tend to respect what another discipline does because they know they haven't got the specialised training that's needed to cope with the other area. So very few physicists are going to go and attack what chemists say, even though they might think they're better than chemists. But that doesn't apply to economics. Nothing, no discipline that accepts the assumptions I'm about to show you can be regarded as a science. And no scientist needs special training to know these are mad assumptions. So they really should be getting in there and attacking them. So I'll go through the major ones. First of all, that assumption that the, the weak relationship we find between temperature and GDP now can be used to predict the impact of global warming. They call this the statistical approach. Okay, And this assumes that the observed variation of economic activity with, cl over, with climate over space, so what you find today comparing one part of the world to another part of the world in terms of both temperature and, and income, that will apply to space as well. Now, what I've done here, this chart, you can see the dots, uh, they are showing the temperature deviation with the United States average on the horizontal axis and the GDP, a gross state product, deviation from the gross domestic product for America on the vertical in terms of percentages. And you can see the scatter. I mean, there's hardly any pattern, okay? And what that's saying is, if you're in the United States, then climate isn't a major determinant of income. But if you try to fit a curve to it, you can fit a parabola, y equals x squared. And that's what's done there. And that shows you a pretty bad prediction with that blue line. But what it's telling you, and that's what I've been showing about here, let bring my mouse to activate here, is that a six degree increase in temperature is gonna reduce GDP by 10%. Equally, if we freeze the planet by six degrees, that'll also reduce the GDP by 10%. Now that's of course the level of the last ice age. So this is nonsense, but that's what they do. Uh, and then they say, well, you, you can all, what they've done, and this is what really pisses me off, economists talk about specialization. You know, it's important to specialize at what you're good at and we'll get more output if, if people specialize what they're good at. Well, economists aren't good at climate modeling. What have they done? They've built their own climate models inside these, what they call integrated assessment models. And they, all of them, ignore precipitation. So this is the, this is the paper I mentioned, what, one of the papers, 2021. Effects on precipitation have yet to be incorporated in economic studies. So all their models, there is only temperature is going to change. And this is one of my favorite assholes in the industry is a guy called Richard Toll, another technical term, but I'll explain that one later. And he, in a paper which said it would be good if the Gulf Stream collapsed, it'd be good, okay? Because he has a model where the temperature change, the, if the Gulf Stream collapsed, Europe will get colder, which counteracts global warming. Therefore, Europe will benefit from um, the collapse of, the, of the, the Gulf Stream. And he then came out, you know, you have a few qualifying statements here. But last year, a paper came out saying, well, actually, the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which is the genuine name of the Gulf Stream, had fallen by 15%. The strength of who said, oh, that's good. And then he quotes his own paper. Okay, so this is the shit. That's another technical term. I'll explain that one later too. This is the shit they're throwing at. The politicians are swallowing because they don't know. They don't, all they see is the numbers. They don't see how the numbers are generated. Now, some of the economists realize, well, it's pretty crazy to sort of look at a static period for temperature and GDP. Let's do it dynamically. Let's see what's happened to change in temperature and change in GDP between 1960 and 2017. That's an improvement. What they then do is they extrapolate that out to 2100. You don't need to be a scientist to see that that gray area, which is the, the error bars and their prediction, that is a linear extrapolation. So they've said we can take what's happened between 1960 and 2017 with the temperature increase and the decline in GDP from that and extrapolate that forward for the next 80 years. Of course, that's assuming there are no tipping points. Okay. 
And that's good because along comes Dietz and Wagner and co. And they assume you can model tipping points with a quadratic, y equals x squared. Okay. And out of that, they say that if we if we lose all those elements I mentioned earlier, we'll do and, and temperature rises by six degrees, we'll get 1.4 degrees, 1.4 percent lower GDP than if the tipping points didn't disappear at six degrees temperature increase. Well, this is crazy stuff, crazy talk from a scientist's point of view. But what they did, they said we're going to take into account non-market damages, so damages to the environment. And they borrowed a model from 1995. And this model assumed that losses were quadratic and that the losses were 2% of GDP at 2.5 degrees warming. Now, this is what they then say. And I, I just, can you tell me, by the way, if, my, if, if you're seeing the faces, they overlaying the, my chart there? Because it seems to be getting in the way for me. We can see, see your I... screen oh? and the chart. Okay, I was, I've moved them down the bottom for my, my benefit. Here. So that's the chart they've got. That's, they assume that the quadratic, talking about damages to the environment, how much of the environment would be left at different temperature increases was 0 0.0032 times the change in temperature squared. Now, um, this is, is just nonsense. This, this, this paper should have been thrown away in 1995. But this 2021 paper said, oh, we're going to use that. They've, they assume a quadratic. So we'll assume the same thing. And we'll use the same numbers that they chose. Where did this 2% two, two of GDP and 2.5% temperature increase come from? Well, in this 1995 paper, the author said uh, to justify saying that the damages were 2% of GDP or 2% of the environment, that's the way they're using it. As a point of reference, the United States currently devotes approximately 2% of its GDP to all forms of environmental protection. Therefore, that justifies the 2% coordinate. But where did the 2.5 degrees Celsius increase come from? It wasn't 2.5 degrees Celsius warmer in 1990s. Why did they use it? Because they plucked it out of their asses. It's another technical term. Because they're inherently trivialisers, as I said beforehand. So they think that a 2.5 degree, degree increase in temperature might damage the two, reduce the, G, the quality of the environment by 2%. Okay, this is just denialism. Now, if you want to be consistent, if they said, well, 2% of damages in 1995, then roughly in 1995, the infantry was about half a degree in temperature. So they're going to actually take data such as it is. They should have chosen 0 0.5 degrees Celsius increase and 2% damages. Now, what, if we can put this all together, this is back to that same chart. This is what they're saying that uh, it would take a... Um, a, um, I'm, going to, I'm hoping that my, my screen is turning up there. Okay. They were saying that if you had a, a 10 degree increase in temperature, that would reduce uh, the, the damage to the Holocene uh, environment by 32%. 68% it would still be there. Okay. Now, that is crap that should have been thrown out in 1995, but it's been regenerated in 1991 by Dietz and Wagner. Um, so, if you then say, well, what if you use the point 0 0.5 and 2% damages? What does that give you as a quadratic? Well, this is the quadratic, the blue line. And that then predicts the Holocene will be destroyed at 3.54 degrees above pre-industrial. Now, that's getting realistic, but it's a stupid function, okay, because the damages would have to be so much higher at lower levels and we haven't seen them. But there's another mathematical function, quite a simple one, called a logistic which is like, like, it's, it's like a, they call it the S-curve. And if you say, well, let's put that in there, let's assume the damages aren't quadratic, but they're the logistic, then that's the future we face, the green line. Okay? And that's much, more clo much closer to what scientists are actually saying. Now, if you think it's the red line, you don't bother doing anything until you're 10 degrees warmer, if it matters, maybe four degrees, okay? We might start getting worried. You know, five degrees of temperature increase, we lose 10% of the environment. Well, that's pretty bad. Let's stop at 10 Okay, it's a relaxed thing. If you look at the green line, holy shit, we don't want to get it past one. We're already past one. We've got to do something now. That, that's the change in orientation. And the crazy thing is Nordhaus, his bloody Nobel Prize, was given for a model that used the dotted line out there. And that basically says you'd still have something left of the Holocene environment at 20 degrees above pre-industrial levels. 
you wouldn't have life on the planet, okay? This is all crap that's it's just completely delaying our reaction. So what is happening? Scientists are doing the brilliant work that's going into the IPC report, summarised and simplified and the lowest common denominator as well, but nonetheless the research is there. And what do people publish? This is, this is actually a good piece of work by Swiss Ray coming out saying we'd lose 23 trillion by 2050 on current trends. Well, there won't be an economy. Okay, there won't be human society if we let these increases keep on going. So we need to get out of the framing that economists give us and get back to existential risks. And this is the sort of stuff I'm sure people here are familiar with. This is a paper by Stefan and Co in 2018 saying that we have this glacial limit cycle that's the blue and then the little curve bit here that is the natural cycle that humans have imposed ourselves upon. So there's a long period of cold and then a small period of warm and then back down again. That's the natural cycle. And we've pushed ourselves over here. And if we continue going, there'll be a runaway process to a total breakdown of the climate. We have to do something to push ourselves over here. That's the framing we need to get. Now, there's some possibility that this is starting to happen this decade uh, because those so-called carefully controlled environments aren't looking so fabulous. This is the town of Lismore in New South Wales. One of my sisters used to live there. And this McDonald's was built in a region after the floods of a previous period of floods in the 70s in an area that thought was to be immune from the flooding. So they thought the wouldn't water wouldn't reach the road level. We can see where the water is there. It's up, you know, it's up at this height above the sign. Okay, there's, there's the top of the sign there. You can just see it. And of course, we all know Germany forms now that's what neoclassical economists call carefully controlled environments okay and basically if the climate couldn't give a shit about whether you've got a roof over your head it'll it'll destroy it so we're getting current events exposing just how weak the analysis of economists are and the ukraine war is another example we have the incredible dependence of europe on russian fossil fuels now economists would say that's not a problem because energy is only three percent of gdp so if you lose access to half the russian blues you might lose one and a half of gdp what's 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 your problem and the reason that again this is nonsense comes out of the way economists model production this is getting a bit mathematical and technical here, so I know people won't necessarily follow, but I'll, I'll put it there for those who, who do later. So what you have is, a, is, a, is, a, is an equation where you say GDP, and they use Y for GDP, is this factor multiplied by labour raised to this power and capital raised to that power. Now, just to, to deconstruct that, Y is GDP, A is technology, L is labour, and K is capital. And these exponents up here are based on income shares. So... Capitalists get about 30% of GDP, so they give a value of 0.3 to alpha. Now, notice there's no real for energy there at all. So if you start with this framework, you can't see why the environment damage to the environment is going to be a problem because you don't take anything out of the environment. You can produce this using labour and capital alone. Uh, now, when they add energy in there, they add it as a third factor. So this is actually a paper from 2016. And as well, I think K to the alpha, they've got uh, e to the, to the new over here, where that's given the value of 0.03 because that's roughly the share that energy has in production. Now, if you feed an 80% fall in energy into this model, what you get is a prediction that an 80% fall in energy will only cause a 5% fall in GDP. So there's the graph. Let's say energy falls by 80%. You have a 95% of output still, so you've only had a 5% fall in production. So why bother? You know, nothing important about it. Well, I, my positive contribution to this literature, which is what I, I did before I got involved in critiquing the neoclassicals, was the simple insight that labour without energy is a corpse and capital without energy is a sculpture. And what that means is that energy is not another factor of production, so K, L and E all independently, but E, energy is an input to both capital and labour without which they can't do work. So you change the form of the function from three uh, elements to, to with, with each independent to three, but one is an argument into the other. So if we've got to put energy into a machine and energy into a worker before they can do work. So what it means is you end up having this function. And I know this is a bit technical, but I'll, I hope you can cover the points here. And, and you can say, well, the, the energy input of the number of machines times the energy per machine times how efficiently a machine turns that energy into useful work. And the same thing for labour, the number of workers times how much energy we consume, which was trivial back in the Roman days, okay, for Roman slaves, and enormous for us now, where you've some enormous amount of energy, times how much that's turned into work. Now, um, when you look at the, the, the human situation, 
this pair here, how much energy we consume times how much the energy is turned into useful work, that's pretty much a constant. It's about 100 watts, okay? That's about the energy that a worker can put in physically. But the EK, the energy input to a machine, that's been growing exponentially over time. If you go back to James Watt, it was about nine tonnes of coal per day for the James Watt engine. If you go forward to now, it's, it's nine per second for uh, Elon Musk's rockets. So that's the change that we're going through. So I put that together. And what that means is, you, this is the technical bit. I'm sorry for the elaboration here. Before, the E had the, a power of nu, which is 0 0.03. But now it's alpha, which is 0.3, 10 times the impact. So I put that together. What that tells me is that, and this is to show why economists have got it so wrong, why their minds can't comprehend how important this is, because they don't understand what I'm showing you right now. This would be novel to economists, okay? But then when you put that in and say, well, it's actually point, it's not uh, 0 0.03, it's 0 0.3, then your 80% fall in energy means a 38% fall in output. And that's a bit more serious. Got to start worrying about it. But that's not enough because Mankiw, and this is, he's a conservative economist, so I'm very happy I can quote him, did some very good empirical work comparing different countries using this production function and said that the model doesn't even make sense of international data unless you change the value of alpha from 0.3 to 0.8. Now, if I do that and I feed that in, then what I got out of that, 80% fall in energy will mean a 72% fall in output. And that's much more serious. We've gone from 0.5% fall to a 72% fall. And that even that's not enough because the, the Cobb-Douglas production function form I've shown there is very complicated, but there's another one which post-Keynesian economists like myself use, and that said output is just how much of your machinery you're utilising multiplied by the amount of machines divided by uh, what's called a capital output ratio. And I've shown since then that when you take into account energy, it's the, how much you, the, its capacity utilisation times the machines times the efficiency with which they turn energy into useful work. And that generates, gives you waste as well, by the way, which is left out of neoclassical thinking. And the waste has to exceed the output. So you, this is an approach that says waste and energy are incontrovertible. And when you do that, what you get is 100% ratio. 80% fall in energy, 80% fall in output. And this is much more serious. And the empirical data supports that. If you take a look at the relationship between uh, energy and GDP, the, the horizontal line is energy. I'll have to bring this down again and have it shows up. That's world energy consumption in, uh, I think it's, I've forgotten what it could be, I think it's kilotons of uh, energy equivalent um, in terms of oil. And this is world GDP. It's a straight line fit. And the correlation coefficient is pretty much one. And that's the basis of the work, energy work that I show in the manifesto. And also, I've that part I went to quickly there. I've got a, a free technical book for those who want to understand the modeling that I'm doing called Modeling with Minsky, which is linked, and I'll send the presentation over later. Now, what you get when you look at that is not just the, is the level of GDP and the level of energy tightly correlated, but the change is incredibly tightly correlated. You can see that the change, annual change in world energy and annual change in GDP between 1970 and 2017, the correlation is 0.83, which is pretty damn high, uh, but it's also one for one. 6% increase in energy, 6% increase in GDP. And that justifies another set of modelling I've done and I'll, again, I'll come back to that if you want to see it. If, if Kate's not around, I can cover this detail here. You can actually build cyclical models that can show source depletion of resources, pollution undermining of capacity use. This is what we should be doing as economics, but of course of neoclassicals, we're not. And why did I choose the 80% decline figure? It's because at the very best of situation, if we were forced by catastrophic changes, you know, let's say the Netherlands gets wiped out by a storm, I mean the Netherlands, like in everybody who gets drowned, flooded. That's feasible if we lose the AMOC because according to the research I showed you from Hansen beforehand, you'll get 40 metre waves, the storms generating 40 metre waves turning up if the AMOC goes and we have a two degree increase in temperature. Um, well, we were forced to suddenly say, that's it, no more carbon dioxide. How much of a fall in GDP could we affect? Roughly 80% because this is just extrapolating where we've got to at the moment. Even with the growth in renewables that were going on between 2000 and, uh, I don't know, go back again, between uh, 2008 
and uh, 2013, we extrapolate that forward, we still haven't cracked 20% of, of energy output coming from renewables alone. Um, so that dependency we have, which again, just to repeat that chart, will mean that if we are forced to stop using fossil fuels, we'll be forced to have a GDP decline as well. And that'll be long before we hit four degrees, let alone the six that, that uh, Neo, Nord, Nordhaus craps on about. So we've got to hammer economists on this uh, for failing. And frankly, I think that should be one of the main targets of Extinction Rebellion. We, should, we need to get, given the, how bad the work is that neoclassicals have done, we have to remove them from the debate. Now, I know most of the focus is on fossil fuel companies and how they're the ones that are leading the anti-climate change action armies. But your arms dealers are neoclassical economists. If they couldn't quote the neoclassicals, they couldn't make the arguments, again, trivialising the dangers we face. And again, I have a paper, an academic paper, which is open access, where I first went through and showing just how incredibly bad this work is. It's the worst work I've seen in 50 years of being a critic of mainstream economists. So this now gives us a practical issue as well, which we need to focus on as well. Can we transition to 100% renewables before we reach critical levels of carbon dioxide? And the answer I'm afraid is frankly, no. It's an ex extremely good study, very, very comprehensive, done by, as it happens in Australian um, mining engineer called Simon Michau now works for the, the Geological Survey of Finland. And he went doing very a meticulous analysis of how could we replace the actual effective use of energy with, uh, with just fossil fuel, with, with getting, if we got rid of fossil fuels. And it's this complete replacement, what could we actually do? And this is the study here, and this is depressing, okay? even more depressing than what I've been doing beforehand. This set of bars here is the amount of energy currently produced by different forms of renewable energy. And this, uh, uh, then that's new, this is nuclear down here. Uh, this next one is hydropower, the blue. The next one after that is solar. Then you have geothermal and bio waste, okay? And he said, if we expanded those on their current scales, how many would we need to replace the fossil fuels, okay? We'd need 800, more than 800 new nuclear power stations, more than 12,000 hydro, more than 63,000 wind farms, 70,000 solar farms, 600 geothermal and 75,000 bio waste. And I think you'd expect we're not gonna do that in 10 years. That is just an enormous level of construction. And the other thing we're not look, focusing on, and this is again, my Simon's work here, is how we are running down the minerals that are needed for this anyway already. Um, and we're going to need government funding to help fund the work to mean we don't use rare earths anymore, we use commoner elements. So this is a brilliant piece of work actually done by the European Union, where they show these are the various uh, elements of the periodic table that are under threat in terms of availability. Helium is one of my favourites because helium is used in quite a few industrial processes. And every time you have a party, uh, you pump a fair bit of helium off the planet because once the balloon goes, the helium goes into outer space. Um, so those are critical ones that serious threats in the next 100 years are already seeing. Uh, the scariest one for me in some ways is phosphorus because human physiology, the physiology of animals requires on turning adenosine triphosphate into adenosine diphosphate. If you don't have phosphate, you, your muscles can't work. And we're already starting to make that one look uh, jeopardized. And there are plenty of others which are essential parts of manufacturing and industrial processes today, which are already in short supply. So we don't have the minerals we need. We need incredibly fast technological advances to move away from, say, lithium based batteries to iron based batteries, for example. So, what we really need from economists is stop making up your own stupid numbers about the damages from climate change, work out how we can finance the level of spending we need to devote resources to um, a defossilization de de of industry as fast as possible. And the government can do it. There's no limit to the government's capacity to create money. And this is a very quick point from modern monetary theory here. And this is using my software Minsky, which I explain in my book as well. When the government runs a deficit, that creates money. It doesn't need to borrow it. It creates money and it creates reserves as well. Those reserves are used by bonds to buy uh, the, by, used by banks to buy the bonds that are then part of how the government is financed. So the government doesn't even need to borrow from the banks in that case. It's letting the banks have 
income assets rather than ones that don't. And if you sell bonds to the public, rather than that raising money for something like we saw before it was happening during the Second World War, that actually reduces people's capacity to spend. The whole idea of selling bonds to the public uh, in a war is to reduce their capacity to spend them on consumer goods and mean that the money instead that's used is uh, government money for, for arming the um, uh, the the country and I explained this in one of what a couple of my Minsky models linked there which again I can come back to if you like and it's also what was learnt during the Second World War and then forgotten that taxes aren't necessary for revenue for this it's government spending that does it and we should enable large amounts of government spending now the other part of this is that I say we 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 will not be able to avoid rationing. If we're going to have a drastic reduction in energy consumption, then there has to be rationing. But you can't ration the poor because if you do, you'll have the gilets jaunes. Okay, the poor are already at the borders; they can actually cope. So one of the proposals I'm working with in, with a, a few other colleagues is the idea of what you call tradable universal carbon credits, and they would be issued through a parallel funding system, like a bit of like a universal basic income, only carbon allowances, and everything you purchase would have two prices: a money price and a UCC price. Now you could set, you don't have to do this at the national level. It could be done at the domestic level. And I think it should start there because if you try to wait the international agreement, it'll never happen. Do it at the domestic level. And you could say, everybody gets the average for this country. So every UK uh, citizen gets an allowance equivalent to the average for the country in terms of carbon consumption. Now, for 95% of the population, that's more carbon than they're consuming already. You won't actually exhaust it. But the top 5% would exhaust their universal carbon credits and have to buy off the bottom 95%. And the poorer you were, the more you'd be able to sell. So it'd be popular with the majority, and it would cause redistribution of income from the rich to the poor. And it's a market mechanism, which is even better. And it puts pressure on the rich and corporations to radically reduce carbon intensity. And that's actually a proposal which a guy called Adam Hardy put together initially. So Adam's work is turning up there. Um, and, and you need the government finances as well, because you've got to re reducing output on this scale is not going to be profitable. Okay? Best argument against being the market way, you must have a way to finance it. So that's my overall work here. Um, uh, and I'm also, I'm running for parliament. This is something which... Um, I would like Extinction Rebellion's help on in Australia because there's bugger all chance of me winning if I can't get how to vote cards into people's hands. But if I do, with the help of Extinction Rebellion activists in New South Wales and Australia, then I can get elected with a little of 8% of the vote. But people have to be aware that I'm running on this campaign. So I've got uh, you know all sorts of ways I'm going to be helped. Uh, we'll talk about that in the discussion here. Um, and that's it for me. I think I've probably gone over time. No, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Steve. Oh, God, just want to think it can't get any worse. It gets worse. I know. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's the denial thing, isn't it? It's like so innately human, but also incredibly frustrating. It um, is, yeah. And look, a better economics would mean less denial because if we had economics which was consonant with the need for energy and, and minerals as inputs to production before Adam Smith, which actually existed, we would have always known we could run out of resources. We'd always know waste was damaging. It's just the stupidity of neoclassical economics that means this has been hidden for so long. <sighs> Thank you. And good luck. <laughs> um, yeah, we do have Kate now oh, as good. well. Great. Oh, okay. yeah. Thank you. Everyone's clapping. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Kate, I'm so sorry that we had our mix up with a time. I'm so glad you could actually join us. Um, let me just officially introduce you. Um, so, Kate Rayworth has created the donut model showing how there should be a balance between essential human needs and planetary boundaries. Also found with this model is that countries globally are either not supporting citizens' needs or are massively going over their share of planetary boundaries. This shows that the state of global economics goes against nature, which again, just sounds crazy. Like, why are we doing this? Um, yeah, lots of people really excited to have you here, Kate. Um, I'm just gonna pass straight over to you. If someone can unmute you as well. I've be. unmuted me. Thank you so much, Gabriella. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, sorry, we all clearly had a mix up on the timing, um, <laughs> but I'm here, and I'm great. I'm I'm glad to have caught some of Steve's presentation as well. So we probably, if we'd both been here from the start, we would have gone the other way round. But it's fine because Steve's dived into 
some really powerful details of what's wrong in the in the nitty gritty of the modeling that most people never get close to. And I'm going to, I think, present what ideas that are really compatible with his, but coming from a very different perspective, which is using images. So I'm not going to use any equations and I'm not using um, detailed economist models, but what I am using are the models that go into our minds, almost the very first thing that gets drawn on the page, which is a picture about the relationship between things. And so this work will look very different from what Steve's been presenting, but I think it's really um, connected and it's just another way of framing economics. So I want to start uh, in a department of economics as Steve's taken us, like what ideas are taught in departments of economics? And I think this really matters, not just for people who study in them, it really matters for, well, first of all, it really matters because a lot of students do a little bit of economics, right? They do a bit of economics and then they go on and become a politician or a business leader or a journalist or a lawyer or an activist. And so that little bit of economics frames how we see the world. And so my biggest uh, critique of economics is with what's called Econ 101. It's the first economics because that's the one that matters the most because it gives the overall frame within it, which everything that then sits. But even if you never studied economics, it powerfully shapes how we hear our politicians speaking. Is there a magic money tree or is there no magic money tree? Does the government run out of money or not? Uh, how we hear the, the um, journalists speaking, how we hear economists speaking. So the frame, we may never actually encounter the diagrams or the equations, but we hear that frame in the language, in the metaphors that are used again and again. So it shapes all of our worldviews. So I want to dive in. And again, I'm I'm going to be pulling out from where Steve's gone very deep, but I'm going to come in, in almost the simplest iconic visualization of mainstream 20th century economics. And, I, and I'm, I'm dubbing that as what has been predominantly neoclassical thinking. So the first image, if I go around the world and ask students, you know, who are here ever studied economic, put up your hand. What's the first image you remember learning? It's the same everywhere, which is extraordinary. The, the consistency of the... Uh, of the propaganda of it. It's, it's supply and demand. It's that market image where supply meets demand and the crisscross is price. And that's a really powerful first move in economics. Welcome to economics, here's the market. As if the market is the economy, puts it at the center of our vision. That's a very political act. And it tells us that price is the metric of concern, which means that immediately the, the metrics in which we are doing economics is money. And it also means that anything that falls outside the price contract has a name. So something that's not reflected in the price paid by the buyer or the seller, it has a name. It's called an externality. And to me, the biggest proof that this is way out of date is that if you ask an economist to talk about the ongoing death of the living world, the decline and collapse of ecosystems, the destabilization of the climate, they say, sure, it's an environmental externality. We've got a chapter on that. Now, to me, the fact that we would call the death of the planet and her life support systems on which we depend an environmental externality is, is itself evidence enough that this framing is utterly out of date and inappropriate for our era. So it needs to be replaced. Second, let me come to the selfie. How do we tell ourselves who we are in economics and the character of, of humanity is rational economic man? He's never drawn, so I decided to give him a portrait. He'd be a man or somebody without dependence. He'd be standing alone, independent. I'm, I have my own values and my own judgments. I'm not influenced by others. He's got money in his hand because that's how he interacts with the world through the market. He's got ego in his heart. He's driven by self-interest. He's got a calculator in his head because he's constantly calculating alternative prices and possibilities and values. He hates work. He loves luxury. He knows the price of everything. The real problem with this character is not just how absurdly narrow a description of us that is, it's that on being told he's like us, we actually become more like him. So researchers like Robert Frank and others have found that the more that students learn about the traits of rational economic man, the more they actually value those very traits as if that's who we should aspire to be rather than this is a very absurdist model of who we might be. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. And that's a, that's a really important point for every academic discipline that aims to describe humanity. It shapes and remakes who we actually are. And then, of course, he's got nature at his feet. So the living world is seen as natural capital. It's seen as resources. It's seen as materials for mankind. We are the asset owners of the living world and can construct them and reconstruct them at our will. And that worldview, of course, massively misses the delicate interbalance of the living world and our, our part in it. And then the last diagram I'm going to introduce here is the goal. 
what is the goal of the economy? Well, this is so deep. This, this graph is never actually shown in any textbook. It's, of course, it's endless growth. So whatever country we live in, and I'm sitting in the UK right now, um, Steve's focused on um, Australia, you know, we are, and many people here, I'm sure, are in um, European or North American countries. These are some of the, well, these are the richest countries in the history of humanity now. And yet, even these countries believe that the success of the economy and the solution to their problems lies in yet more growth. So endless GDP growth is written into, there's a growth dependency written into our institutions, into our assumptions. So no matter how rich we are, we need more growth. And I believe that these deep assumptions that undersit the mainstream economic worldview have led us to some of the crises that we face now, whether it's the financial meltdown of 2008, the era of climate and ecological breakdown that is our era. There's been, of course, a, a, a backlash against the protest that we've seen rising up in protest against this ecological breakdown and COVID lockdown. And of course, the ongoing crisis in Ukraine and the energy crisis that, that's making very clear to the whole world what it means to be dependent on fossil fuels in these times. So these crises show us how deeply interconnected we are with each other and with the rest of the living world. They hit people with sharp inequalities of gender and race, of wealth and power between the global north and the global south. And they arise from the very systems we've created. So these crises arise from systems based upon endless expansion, whether it's the financial system endlessly expanding, you're going to kick up a bubble. Our, our use of fossil fuel and earth resources, it creates climate breakdown. Our, our expansion into areas of wildlife, coupled with endless global travel, we create perfect conditions for a global health pandemic. Can we therefore escape from the idea that success and progress lies in endless expansion? Because this isn't taking us to somewhere we want to be. So I want to start again. And I'm going to start again with quotes from two thinkers. First, Amartya Sen, who said, human development is concerned with advancing the richness of human life rather than the richness of the economy in which human beings live. And his thinking around this was really, has been hugely influential in making economists because he is recognized as an economist and making economists think again, what is development? It's not economic development, it's human development. Now I want to put that together with earth system scientists such as Catherine Richardson, who have said, humanity can affect the functioning of its own life support systems. There are tipping points we are pushing on. How does this change our definition of progress? And even the mention of tipping points, which don't exist, the ecological relationship, as Steve so clearly shown, don't exist in the mainstream economic mindset. So if we begin again with these ideas, where then would we place the first image of the economy? And for me, we should begin not with this is the market. We should begin with what is the goal? What are we what are we trying to achieve here? What are we trying to bring about? And that's what led me to draw the donut. So the goal here. If we think of humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the center, we want to leave nobody in the hole, leave nobody falling below that social foundation, falling short on the essentials of life. And that's where people don't have the resources they need for food and health, education and housing, political voice, income. And these I drew, I drew those 12 dimensions from the Sustainable Development Goals because it means that all the governments in the world have already agreed that every person in the world has a right not to be in this hole. And that's very powerful to be able to say to the UN, these are your values, these are your goals, leave no one in the hole. So we use Earth's resources to meet people's needs, but we know that in the process of doing that, we start to put pressure on the life supporting systems of our planetary home. When we use fossil fuels, we induce climate breakdown and ocean acidification. When we use timber and convert land for agriculture, we convert the land, we lose biodiversity, we withdraw water, we apply fertilizer. These nine dimensions around the outside are known as the nine planetary boundaries, recognized by Catherine Richardson, Johan Rockstrom, Will Stefan, and others in 2009 as the life supporting systems of our planetary home that have held Earth in the Holocene home sweet home era for the last 11 or 12,000 years. And if we overshoot them, then we push on these tipping points and kick ourselves out of this balanced zone. So leave no one in the hole, don't overshoot the limits. And suddenly the shape of progress has utterly changed. It's not endless growth, it's thriving in dynamic balance, like a, like a heartbeat if I do it like this with my hands between these two spaces. And when I first published this in 2012, I was gobsmacked by the traction that this image had. That was what made me realize the power of pictures. People spoke with a different confidence and conviction about these issues, about tackling the concept of endless growth, about transforming um, economic development with this image. 
And it made me think, well, what, how have other cultures depicted the shape of well-being and thriving and health? And of course, indigenous cultures around the world have for millennia used symbols and images that exactly have that sense of a dynamism within a circular space, a dynamic balance. And it suddenly casts the Western economic mindset as the outlier. The idea that or, or other cultures around the world have recognized it's about a holistic balance. And no, the West has said, no, no, it's endless growth. So to me, the, the grand project is here is can we recover in our mindsets a sense? Can we learn from others? Can we relearn from the past? Can we reimagine that progress and well-being actually means coming into balance? It doesn't lie with the metaphor of endless growth. We are very far from balance right now. This image shows the whole world. It shows the millions or billions of people worldwide who are falling short on the essentials of life. Food has a, a red wedge going 11% of the way to the center of the circle because 11% of people worldwide do not have enough to eat every day. So we want to eliminate those red wedges going into that's the shortfall. We want to eliminate it so no one was left below that social foundation. But at the same time, we've got to do that in a context where we're already overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. So again, the power of this image is that it enables us to see, we don't need to say I need one number. I just need GDP, it's so handy, it's one number. Well, actually this is one picture and it's got 21 data points in it. And so it, I can see so much more and I can see it visually and I can imagine what it would look like to see things getting better because the red would be disappearing on the inside and coming in from the outside. So my strong belief is that we can do a lot better with metrics that guide ourselves, no longer flattening life into one monetary number, we can actually represent life in one visual. This is the world. Here are some countries. Malawi, you can see massive human deprivation without overshooting their share of pressure on the planet's systems. China has the double whammy, as many countries do, of both falling short on people's needs and already in significant overshoot. And Sweden, we've got Sweden here because one of the Nordics is often, oh, Sweden and Norway and Denmark, aren't they already ecologically doing incredibly well. Well, they may have clean water and clean air domestically, but their global consumption and global carbon footprint is as big as any other nations in the high income countries. So they have a huge reduction of global impact to achieve. Now that's just three countries. This picture gives you around hundred countries and the sweet spot where you want to be is that top left-hand corner, which is green. That would be where countries meeting all of the social foundations going up the scale. So no falling short on the social side and no ecological overshoot. And what you can immediately see is that there's no country there. The countries that are closest, and let's look for the good news here. The country that's closest is Costa Rica. Uh, why, why, why would Costa Rica be it's closest? Because it's slightly, you know, some falling short on the social foundation and then some overshoot, but it's closer than most. And that's a really important sign that this could be possible. There are countries in the world that actually haven't even been trying to do this yet, haven't shifted their whole economic worldview in this direction, but are some way on the heading there. Costa Rica, of course, have invested really significantly in public health and public education and had a massive reforestation program. So it makes sense that they would be there. But look at all the high income nations, which for all de decades have been called developed countries. They're sticking way out. US, Canada, Australia, way out there. Steve, you've got a lot of work to do. Uh, you've, got, you've got all the European countries sticking way out, massive overshoots. How can any one of these countries say it's developed? I can't think of a single country in the world that should call itself developed because there's no country that meets the needs of all people in its borders within the means of the living planet. So every nation is on an unprecedented transformational journey. How are these low income countries going to meet people's needs for the first time without doing that ecological overshoot that every nation before them has done? How are these middle income countries going to meet everybody's needs while already starting to come back within planetary boundaries, the double whammy. That's not been done before. And how are these high income nations going to actually meet the needs of all people in those nations? Because we know there's deprivation in the midst of plenty in every one of these countries, but massively come back within planetary boundaries. That has not been done before. So every nation here is on an unprecedented journey of transformation. It calls for humility and ambition everywhere. And let's recognize that these countries may stand as separate dots on the page, but they're profoundly interconnected by histories of colonialism, by military power, by trade and finance rules, by resource extraction, by climate and impacts present and future. So the, their histories and their futures are interconnected. 
how do we turn the story around then? What kind of economics would, if we, if it were taught in, in, in universities and schools around the world, if it were practiced in parliaments, what kind of economics will give us a chance of turning the story around? Is that what my passion is around in donor economics? What will give us the story? So I start with this diagram. I would never start with supply and demand. Once we've got the donut, that's our vision. So here we are. We say that this is the embedded economy diagram. It, it combines ecological economics, feminist economics, and commons-based theory. And, and thermodynamics, let me say. And I hope it really chimes to the much more complex model that Steve was just demonstrating, but it sits as a simpler, big worldview, uh, entry point for anybody to go, oh, let's think of it this way. The economy is a subset of society. It's a social construct. It's a set of relationships we've invented and therefore can reinvent about how we produce and distribute and use Earth's resources to meet our needs and wants. It's embedded in society, in social society's legal and political and cultural institutions. And society, humanity is embedded within the living world. We are part of nature and utterly dependent upon it. And look, we're drawing in material, we're putting out waste and pollution. So those arrows going through, that is the ecological economics. The economy is a subset of the living world and therefore is dependent upon it and must be consistent with its cycles. And we're bathed in this river of solar energy. There's a the thermodynamics, energy, right? And Steve was saying the economist just left energy, it's like, oh, 3% of GDP can't be very important. This diagram says, let's talk energy from day one. So it's never gonna work to flatten our economic metrics to money alone. We need to talk in multiple metrics because different kinds of resources matter. So that's the first diagram. Let's go in and say, well, in the economy, there's at least four different kinds of uh, forms of provisioning. Okay, mainstream economics starts with the market. And who are we in the market? We're either consumer producer, shopping or working, or shopping or working. And as Karl Marx pointed out, well, hang on, in the space of production, are you labor earning a wage? Or are you capital taking the profit and dividend and the power relationship between those two? So very important to recognize that. And then mainstream economics will say, well, and market doesn't always work. I mean, first best, but doesn't always work. We might need the state. In relation to the state, we can be a public servant, a resident, a voter, protester, all of these crucial roles that we play in relation to the state. Now, mainstream neoclassical economics and, and GDP, national income accounting, measures this horizontal bar. It shows us the value, the financial cost of goods and services produced either in the market or by the state. And that's what shows up in GDP. But so much is missing. We've got the household where we are parent, partner, relative or child. It's Sunday, right? So most of us, I'm guessing, are probably at home. We are in our household. We have stepped away from our families and our caring and our roles in those relations. But these are essential roles of well-being and the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping, raising the kids this is what makes life work and it what makes society work well. And then there is the commons, where we, we may be a volunteer or sharer or co-creator or steward. We're a collaborator. We, as Extinction Rebellion, it's a network of people coming together. Here are our shared rules. We are going to co-create this rebellion. And money need not change hands, but massive value is created through the commons. So I want to always start recognizing that the way we provision for our wants and needs, there are at least these four fundamental means. The market and the state, that's the mainstream view. Do not forget the household, as any feminist economist would tell you. Do not forget the commons, as the Nobel Prize winning Eleanor Ostrom would tell you, because these are essential and they may not be monetized, but they are essential. We've also got finance, of course, in the middle there. And I'll just simply say for now, finance needs to be designed and redesigned so that it is in service to the healthy functioning of these means of meeting our wants and needs in service to life. We've actually got a financial system now that is very much in service to itself. So how would we redesign finance to be in service to enabling this? And then I think one thing that COVID made really clear using this framework is that when the market space is literally shut down due to the need for physical distancing, well, a lot of it goes online and some digital billionaires become extraordinarily rich and control those networks. But also the state steps in and we have massive conversations about whose work is essential work and why, therefore, is it so low paid? And the state steps in in ways that it would previously have said were impossible. The state shuts the schools, shuts the borders, pays the nation's wages, invests in the vaccine, um, finds hotels for the homeless and steps in a way that we were, we've been told could not be done. But also the household takes on huge amounts of 
unpaid caring work, whether it's caring for the sick, whether it's homeschooling kids. Some people did this with joy. Some people found this a situation of great stress and increased domestic violence because so much was loaded onto the household. And the commons, the commons come through as whether it's a street WhatsApp group or a community kitchen or a food bank or indeed a rebellion. The community getting together and saying we are going to mobilize because we can create value when we connect and work together. And what most people have said in surveys around the world is that as we emerge from this crisis, what we don't want to lose is that collective sense of a we. We are not the, I, I, the isolated, rational economic man. We are the social adaptable humans and we need to collaborate and draw on the values and the skills that enable us to work in all these sectors. Students going to the university to learn economics, I'm going to just simplify and say, are taught to be market actors, are taught to be market actors. Some might do a master's in public policy and learn to be a state actor. Where are the skills? Where is the training to be a commons, a commoner? Where are the skills to learn to be a good commoner? Where are the skills to recognize what it means to provide the unpaid caring work of the household and how we make sure that when we talk about the economy, we make room for all of these identities because each one of us holds all of them. So pulling back to the donut, if we are in this space of overshoot and shortfall, what to me this is screaming is the world is incredibly unequal. That's why billions of people can't meet their most utterly essential needs and we're already a massive overshoot of the planet's limits because we've got some people with huge impacts on the planet. And it's also incredibly degenerative. We are running down the life support systems of the one living planet in the universe that's known and we utterly depend upon it and a part of it. How do we turn this story around? For me, as well as the goal of the donut, it's about creating the dynamics in the economy that we need. And I believe we need two fundamental dynamics, to be regenerative by design and to be distributive by design. So we've inherited linear degenerative industrial systems. The, the norm, the mindset, the thinking was you just take us materials, you make them into stuff, you use it for a while, often only once, and then you throw it away. And in fact, the faster you throw it away, the sooner the customer will come back and buy another one. So you have inbuilt obsolescence. This is what is running down the life support systems of our planetary home. We need to urgently move away from a mindset that says this works on planet Earth because it doesn't. We need a regenerative, distributive or circular cyclical economy so that we realize that resources aren't used up. They're used again and again. Nature knows no waste. Nature turns every waste from one product into food for the next. So how do we do that? How do we regenerate the biological materials? How do we regenerate the technical human made materials so that we work with and within the cycles of the living world? This will begin to be an economy that actually belongs and works within that living world that I showed in the embedded economy diagram. Some examples from the scale of cities because that's where we've been doing most of our work. Um, cities and, and places. So whether it's regenerative agriculture, agriculture that actually restores the soil, the quality, the carbon in the soil and by biodiversity where you are, circular construction. In a, oh, no, let me go this way. So um, on, the, on, the, on the left hand side, you've got the biological systems being regenerative. So whether it's agriculture that's regenerative or currently this city in China has a sponge city. They, they know they're going to be prone to flooding and more so due to climate change. So on the edge of the city, you have the storm water park that absorbs water. How do you allow nature and allow cities to be reconnected with nature in this regenerative way? And then on the right hand side, the technical materials, the human made materials. Amsterdam is saying um, in, we've got to become circular by design and construction has to use materials that can be used again and again. Materials will have a passport or let's get cars out of the city centre. Let's transform the ways of mobility so that we're actually decarbonizing our transport. Car free city centre in Oslo. You can think of many, many more examples. These are just very specific, tangible examples that everybody can understand. But we could also think about macro policy that's regenerative by design. Then we also need to, to move from divisive economies that have tended to capture value and opportunity in the hands of a few through infrastructure, through privilege, through inheritance, through regulation. We've seen uh, almost the trebling of billionaires in the world over the last decade, especially that's been fueled by the COVID crisis. So we have economies that drive returns into the hands of a few. How do we transform that into economies that are distributed by design, meaning that value and opportunity are shared with all who co-create it? And that turns out to be the whole of society. Again, just a few very specific tangible examples can be from 
renewable energy that does not have to have a huge amount of capital invested in an oil rig or a gas pipeline because renewable energy is distributed by design. It's solar panels on every roof, it's wind turbines dotted on the landscape, and therefore it can be owned in a far smaller way. I'm, I'm sitting under a, a, some solar panels that happen to be on the roof of my house. That means I and, and millions of others can be energy producers in a way that was never possible last century because of it's a small and micro distributive design of that technology. How can we use solar microgrids in countries like Kenya and everywhere? The cycling network here in the city in China, again, putting in networks that mean cyclists get priority and protection rather than danger on the edge of the curb. So putting 21st century transport at the, at the center of mobility networks. I'll jump to social housing in Vienna. It's fascinating that over 60% of people in Vienna live in social housing, which is central, normal, affordable, because decades ago, the city decided that housing is not a luxury investment option for those who have too much money and they think, well, I'll, I'll buy some, I'll buy a, you know, some, some apartments and flats to, to just repin the rent on that. Housing is a human right. And so the city or city owned cooperatives own a lot of the housing. And it means that housing there is far more affordable than most other comparable European cities. And then here I've got an example of open hardware in Togo, a place that has been seen as an electronic dump of the world and pe brilliant people there have taken the waste that's dumped there and begun to create a circular economy, reclaiming the, the resources and actually using the open hardware movement to build the devices, build 3D printers, build frames, build computers. So to start creating a circular economy out of the waste of the linear economy that's been imposed upon them. You can think of many, many more distributive policies. And I, I'll say that to me, the fundamental one is public health, public education, um, public transport, investing in what George Monbiot would call public luxury, so that the essentials of life are provided affordably, equitably to all in society, and in a much lower carbon way than if everyone tries to provide privately. So we need to become regenerative and distributive by design. I'm going to share very, so I've shared these 20th century images, I've wiped them from the page, let's replace them with 21st century concepts. What if this was actually the starting point for the 21st century students? So our high school students and university students began with concepts like these and of course went on to model them and of course you ask themselves what are the metrics what are the kinds of models is it steve's tools how can we lean further in and, and enrich and go further and further into model how would this change the way we talk about the economy the metaphors we use we wouldn't talk about endless growth we talk about thriving we talk about balance we wouldn't try to measure our economic output in one number flattened into gdp We'd use a metric like the donut. We'd see the multiple metrics and measure life in its own terms. I'm going to stop there. I, I, I had more slides, but I, I'll, I'll come back and share them if, if anybody wants to ask a question, because I, I think there's plenty of talking. I'll stop there and really look forward to any questions you want to bring. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I feel like hopeful for the first time. Um, yeah. Wow. Thank you. Um, yeah, we just got to make it happen now, haven't we? <laughs> um, so I think first we're going to hear from Craig. So the Just Stop Oil campaign to tell you Extinction Rebellion, Rebellion is happening on the 9th of April and kind of running alongside that, there's this campaign called Just Stop Oil, uh, which is like a single project. So Extinction Rebellion is the movement. And then there's this single project called Just Stop Oil, which is to stop new fossil fuel licenses but Craig's going to tell you about that now um, and then we're going to hear from a couple of people as to why they're stepping up into civil resistance and why it's necessary so I'm just going to pass straight over to you Craig thank you so much Kate that was incredible and Steve um, I've just learned so much and I keep learning stuff all the time um, Craig over to you thank you very much uh, yes and thank you Kate and Steve I'd be lying if I I didn't say that's left me a bit uh, discombobulated. Um, I did 20 years in the city, and I, and I know that the world is, is so intertwined with this kind of economic growth and, and making money. And, you know, everything that Steve said has just driven home to me that the politicians are, are not going to come and save us unless we push them into it. Uh, Thankfully, a lot of what Kate said has, has left me with a feeling of hope. Um, but, you know, no one is going to come and save us if we don't do this for ourselves. You know, the IPCC was set up 30 years ago 
Governments have known about this for over three decades. As Steve highlights, they're cherry picking the, the studies and the economics that suit their narrative for just eternal growth, which, you know, you can't have on a finite resource, right, on our, on our planet. You know, we've, we've got to take hold of this. And as you know, for most of you who are involved in, in probably Extinction Rebellion um, and other groups that have at their core civil resistance. And we know it works, don't we? We know from, you know, the suffragettes to the civil rights movements in America, to the Gilets Jaunes, you know, to the Arab Spring. We know this stuff works. And we know if we sit back and wait for our politicians, that isn't going to work. You know, most of you are familiar with Sir David King. And he said a year ago that what we do in the next three or four years is going to determine the future of humanity. Well, that's down to two to three years now. He's aware that we're hitting these tipping points. Steve talked about AMOC. You know, there was a report out last week about the Amazon being very close to the tipping point where it stops to function. So if we said we have two to three years now to take big, bold actions and put into place the change that's needed to stop, you know, what Sir David Attenborough and, and the UN call the end of civilization as we know it. We need this year to be the year that we set that snowball moving. Well, we don't have time to sit back and wait. As Gabby mentioned, there's, there's this thing called Just Stop Oil. And, you know, you're going to be asked, what is Just Stop Oil? What's it about? Is it a new movement? Is it an environmental group? And, you know, I think what it is, it's a rallying cry. Right? We're trying to bring together people from every other environmental movement. Because if we do not get our first win this year, I firmly believe it's too late and it's all over. If we have two to three years to put into effect the massive changes we need, not just in the UK, but around the world, we need to start now. Right? And if you're asking yourselves, why should it be the UK and why should it be you? It should be the UK, because if you were looking at it on the level of a donor match, right? we are the perfect match. We started this shit. The Industrial Revolution started here. Nobody is more culpable of the mess we find ourselves in today than the United Kingdom. On top of that, we have the luxury of being in, in still a really free Western democracy. I think I saw last week that 132 activists have been killed in Colombia this year. That doesn't happen in the UK. You get locked up here from being an environmental protester. You get, you get made three cups of tea during the 12 hours you're in, a, in police custody. You get asked what you want to eat and if you're a vegan, right? We started this. We have the luxury of being able to protest without being locked up with the keys being thrown away, without being murdered. It is on us. And it's on us on this chat today, right? There may be 70 million of us in the country but there were less than 100,000 who we'd call committed activists who realise that if not us, then who? So Just Stop Oil, in the next two weeks, are going to come together and launch a number of actions of civil resistance that rely on people like you and me. I'm not a lifelong environmental activist. I spent 20 years in the city. I now build eco homes. And I've been dragged into this, kicking and screaming, really. Well, I'm not going to lie to you. I'd rather be playing golf today than doing this. But I need to be doing this. I need to be here because I need to be able to look at myself in the mirror and say I gave, gave every last drop. I didn't leave anything on the table. Now, if you're more concerned that during the course of this year, you may be arrested, then this isn't for you. 
Well, this isn't for you. We're talking about the end of civilization. And everybody is going to have to make some sacrifices. You can decide now to draw your line in the sand. And you can say, okay, I'm willing to risk arrest. I'm willing to risk getting arrested two or three times. Or like some of the Insulate Britain protesters being arrested a dozen times. Because that is what it's going to take to get this government to change their policies. The alternative is sitting back, letting it happen, and saying in 10 years' time, shit, I wish I'd done more. And as Sir David King will tell you, once we go past these tipping points, there is no bringing them back. Once there's no sea ice left in the Arctic, once the Amazon goes, it is all over. We hit the domino effect. Right, Johan Rockström, who Kate mentioned, you know, he says when we hit two degrees, we hit five. There's no bringing this back. We have a very short window here. And please, I implore you to join us and help us make this happen. OK, what we're asking the government to do is an absolute no brainer. Right, normally with things, if you're going to get a train or a plane to the south of France, you can do a tick list, can't you? And you can say, well, yeah, that may be cheaper, but this is more environmentally friendly. That takes longer to get there. But what we're asking the government to do now is to not give out any more fossil fuel licenses in the UK. No more drilling in the North Sea for oil and gas. No fracking, no more coal mines in the UK. But those things are all wins, right? All wins. We can build new solar farms, new wind farms more quickly than we can drill and get more oil and gas from the North Sea. Morally, environmentally, there's absolutely no argument, is there? Right? On cost, there's no argument. Before the price rise, wind and solar were cheaper. Now they're under half the price of gas, under half the price, and that's going to go to a quarter by next summer. Right? So whether you measure with a calculator or whether you measure with a conscience, this is a win on every single level. Right? The government wants us to go drilling in the North Sea. There's absolutely no reason for it. We do not own that oil and gas. The 18 companies that drill there own it. For every pound they pay us, we give them 20 pounds in subsidies. Okay, On no level does it add up. And as Steve and Kate say, you know, we, and, and not just them, by the way, right? Every, every climate scientist, we need to move as quickly as we can. That does not involve any new licenses. The International Energy Agency said last year, if we're serious about keeping temperature rise below one and a half degrees C, no more new fossil fuel projects. They didn't say, but crack on in the North Sea. Right? They didn't. So there's no economic, there's no moral argument. We have to stop the government doing this. Now, I'm meant to be here today to say to you, please join us and risk getting arrested once. And if you can't do that, please give us some of your time to help us put talks on around the countries or donate some money. But a football team, first and foremost, needs players, right? We do need someone to wash the kit. We do. And we do need a sponsor. But what I want you to do today is commit to joining us in two weeks' time. Be on the streets. Help us send a message to this government before it's too late. Please risk arrest. And please don't stop after your first arrest. Because the, the future of humanity really does rely on what we do in the next few weeks. Thank you very much. I'll pass you back to Gabby. Oh, getting hyped. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, I'm very excited about the campaign. I'm not going to talk about how excited I am. I'm going to go straight to... Um, who have we got first? Sue? Sue, why, why are you stepping up for Just Stop Oil? Everybody. Oh, because... There you go. Sorry, Hello, go Gabby. On. Thank you. Um, because I love donuts. What a lovely world it would be, a donut world. Anyway, 
Um, my name is Sue and I live in, in East Anglia in Suffolk. I'm retired and I have signed up to Just Stop Oil and to engage in civil disobedience. Now, I'm just an ordinary person. I was the first person in my family to have a higher education and I've had all the ordinary things that um, we expect to have. I got married, I bought a house, I had a car, had holidays, I had three children and you know, life is good, life was good, life is good. Um, I was aware of the environment on a low sort of level. Um, I've been, our family's been vegetarian for nearly 40 years and now I have three lovely grandchildren. But one day I found myself, I don't know how, but I found myself at a Heading for Extinction talk in our local Quaker meeting house. And I listened and I heard and I was totally shocked that the speaker had decided that she was going to remain childless. And that struck home to me so badly, you know, such a serious decision for a woman to make. And, and the words that she spoke really went into my heart. And, you know, ever since that talk, I've really wished that I didn't have gone to it because my life changed after that. And, you know, that sort of stuff that you've heard today, you can't unhear that. So how did we get into this state? I just don't understand how we let it get so, so bad. Anyway, I was one of the Insulate Britain people. So how did I get into that? Well, again, I must stop going to these talks. I ended up at a Zoom talk um, last year and Roger Hallam was speaking. And when I heard the proposition, I threw my hands up in the air and thought, fuck that for a grain of soldiers, you know, really, I'm not doing that. But something went in again and I listened to the Zoom talk again. And then I had a lovely long phone conversation with a, an activist. And before I knew it, I signed along the dotted line. I must be just crazy, I thought. Was I crazy? And then I thought about all the other people in the past who'd stepped up for things that they believed in and that their fight had got me the privileges and advantages that I enjoyed. You know, I have the vote, I was educated, we have trade unions of sorts, you know, we have holidays, all those things, they don't give them to us, we fought for them. No, other people fought for them. So, and then I thought to myself, you know, would I have been one of those people? And I think it turns out that it would, because I signed up for Insulate Britain and I've signed up for Just Stop Oil. And it was the most amazing experience I've had. I met wonderful people along the way, courageous people, in strange locations like glued onto the M25 or in the back of police cars. And I really believe I was part of something. I believe I am part of something. And now I'm signed up for Just Stop Oil, civil resistance. And I'm actually, this sounds odd, but I'm grateful for the experience I've had. And I'm grateful for the people that are organizing it because. And I'm grateful for the fellow rebels and the people I've met along the way, because it's given me the opportunity to be a brave warrior, which is a, a role that I never expected for myself in my 60s. It's been wonderful and terrifying in equal measure. And I'm hoping that my actions will make me a grandma that my, my grandchildren can be proud of. It's challenged me to stand for my principles and it's tested me to face my fears and do it anyway. And now you have found out how bad the situation is listening to this talk and I'm sure you've heard other things in other places. So I'm inviting you to join us. It's, it's people like you and me that can make the change happen. And 
just remember, we've just got so little time left. Thank you, Gabby. <laughs> Sue, I want you to be my grandma. My grandma's still calling climate change my beliefs. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be really rude and say to David, I'm sorry, David, let's just all know that David was going to say something equally as inspiring and we'd have all got very emotional about it, but we do need to go into breakout rooms. I'm going to say a big thank you again to Steve and Kate. You are totally welcome to, yeah, people are clapping. <laughs> you are totally welcome to stay for breakout rooms, but I know you're probably very busy. And Kate, obviously you're very welcome to sign up for civil resistance. We would love to have you. Um, yeah, so now they're going to do techie stuff. Uh, go on, Steve, you can say something. I just want what I'm saying. I'm, you know, I agree entirely with what Craig was saying beforehand. This is the stuff where you have to you know, do your blockades and do your so, uh, civil disability disobedience, and you've got the capacity in the UK as as happens in Australia as well. I'm actually taking the political campaigning route. This sheer accident, I find myself running for the Senate in New South Wales for a, a small party which is actually dedicated to getting ethics back into into politics in general. And there's a reasonable chance in the Australian political system that I can get elected, but I need as much help as I can get from people who are able to hand out how to vote leaflets and what am I standing for and so on in that election. So I know this, I'm not talking to the right part of Extinction Rebellion here. I need help from people in New South Wales, specifically in Australia. But I would really appreciate Extinction Rebellion's help here, getting activists in New South Wales to help me get those leaflets out there so there's some chance that I can get inside Parliament. So um, that's my request. I will have to go because I've got a social function here now. But if that can be organised, uh, that'd be fantastic. So Craig, others, uh, consistence there, I'd be delighted. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you so much, Steve. Thank okay, you. Bye.